Chapter One More Powerful Than Law There was a massive explosion, and it was so strong that it made tall buildings collapse. People were scared, and there were screams everywhere. Kids, older folks, and young adults were trapped under the fallen buildings, crying for help. It felt like the end of the world. After some time, when everyone realized what had happened, they rushed to the place of the explosion. They worked together to rescue those trapped under the rubble. Sometimes they found hands and feet sticking out, and other times only heads. It was a very sad scene, and people were crying as they pulled others out. The police and the army arrived to help, along with other groups of people who wanted to assist. They quickly started helping the injured, putting them in ambulances and sending them to the hospital. But soon, the nearest hospital ran out of space, so they had to send the injured to other hospitals in the city. It seemed like all the hospitals in the city would be full that day. Some bodies were even found on the roofs of tall buildings. The explosion was so powerful that it had thrown them up there. At first, they couldn't be seen, but later, some vultures circling in the sky gave away their location. People went to check, and they found human bodies on the rooftops. They immediately informed the police, and the authorities collected the bodies from the roofs. On the radio and TV, there were lots of scary news reports with loud sounds and scary words. Leaders and important people were on the screen, and they were sad too. They told everyone to stay calm and be thankful, and they promised that those causing trouble would be caught soon. After all those scary news reports, there was something different on TV. They talked about a cricket match between India and Pakistan. Zishan asked his father about the people causing explosions. Dad, who are these people causing trouble? Zishan wondered. His father replied, "These are bad people who want to harm our country, son." Zishan looked serious. Dad, are they really powerful? More powerful than you? His father smiled mysteriously, making Zishan curious. Dad, why don't they have a special police unit to catch these bad people? Why do you have to do it? Son, his father explained, "It's my duty as a police officer to protect the people. We're trying our best to catch them." Zishan wasn't convinced. Dad, it sounds like what they say on TV every day. Shouldn't there be a better plan? His father sighed. Zishan, we're doing our best. Zishan grinned. Dad, I'm growing up now. I want to be a brave police officer and catch these bad people, and I'll do it better than anyone else. His father nodded proudly. Zishan, I hope you become a great police officer one day. These troublemakers won't be around forever. Chapter 2 Suspicious Activities Zishan had been really worried for the past few days. Explosions were happening all over the country, in Peshawar, Rawalpindi, Quetta, and almost every city you could think of. Every night at 9 o'clock, he would sit in front of the TV, praying that there wouldn't be any news of explosions that day. And then, he would argue with his father, trying to understand why these explosions were happening and why the saboteurs responsible for them hadn't been caught yet. Zishan's father was a senior police officer, known for his bravery in dealing with criminals. He used to go after robbers who hid in the forests of Sindh, kidnapping people and demanding large ransoms for their release. Zishan remembered a day when his father had come to him and said, Son, I want those robbers to kidnap you. 
It was all part of a well thought out plan. Zishan was trained, and the bandits did kidnap him. With Zishan's help, the police managed to find the bandits' hideout. Zishan's father's name was Imran, but most people called him Mr. Aga. He had recently been transferred from Karachi to Rawalpindi, where he now worked as a senior instructor at the police academy. He was a highly experienced police officer, and the government had hired him to train new police recruits. One day, some senior police officers came to Mr. Aga's house, and Zishan overheard them talking about their worries regarding the saboteurs. The situation was quite confusing, and Zishan couldn't make sense of it. He went to Mr. Aga for advice. The police had arrested some people they suspected of being saboteurs, but they were receiving recommendations from various sources to release them, claiming that they were not saboteurs but respected individuals. What do you think? Mr. Aga asked the police officers. Are the people we've arrested innocent, or are they saboteurs? Inspector replied, it's hard to say for sure right now. We haven't started the investigation yet, but we arrested them because they were involved in suspicious activities. The problem is, after every arrest, we start waiting for referrals and phone calls. The longer the delay, the slower the wheels of justice turn. We should prioritize the investigation immediately after an arrest so that we can determine if we've made a mistake. If we have, we should release the innocent person as soon as possible. Zishan listened quietly, realizing that the saboteurs had been caught, and now his father would do everything in his power to ensure justice prevailed. <laughs> Chapter 3 Caught the Saboteurs One morning, when Zishan woke up early, he excitedly told his father about a dream he had. Dad, last night, I had a dream. In the newspaper, there was big news, police caught the saboteurs, and your picture was on the front page. His father smiled and said, you know, sometimes dreams do come true. Zishan, however, pondered for a moment and replied, Dad, maybe we can also make our dreams come true ourselves. His father, Mr. Aga, glanced at Zishan and continued with his breakfast. Dad, Zishan persisted, Inspector Shoaib, uncle, was saying that they've caught the saboteurs. They've been chasing them day and night. Mr. Aga smiled, well, you see, I'm a police officer's son, and we're always after the bad guys. Zishan felt encouraged and asked, Can I come to the police station with you to see the saboteurs? Mr. Aga had to visit the police station to observe the people they suspected of being saboteurs. He agreed to take Zishan along but warned him not to get too involved. Zishan was determined. When they reached the police station, Inspector Ahmed, in charge of the case, had brought the suspects out of the lockup and was questioning them. Zishan watched them nervously. One of the men had small, cat-like eyes, prominent eyebrows, a prickly mustache, and golden hair. And the other one, like an ordinary person, Mr. Aga asked Inspector Ahmed if he had taken their statements and learned anything useful. Inspector Ahmed replied, No, sir, not yet. Mr. Aga asked, Do you believe these two are innocent? Inspector Ahmed responded, Yes, sir. Mr. Aga was puzzled. Then why are they still here at the police station? Inspector Ahmed explained, they're waiting for their ride, sir. Mr. Aga decided to leave and walked out of the police station with Zishan. Zishan had visited the police station before to see thieves and doctors. 
He couldn't resist asking his father. He asked his father that he did not ask the inspector whether he had taken the prints of both hands or not. Dad, did you ask inspector if they've started a file on them? I have a feeling one of them might be connected to the saboteurs. Mr. Aga sighed, Zishan, we should let the police do their job. They know what they're doing. It's not right for us to interfere. Besides, I'm in the police academy now, and I need to maintain the appropriate boundaries. Zishan persisted, but, Dad, you've helped police officers before with their cases. If you allow me to talk myself, Zishan asked his father for such information. Come on, if you are stubborn, ask, but speak with distinction. Sir, I am not in a police, so why I will? Sorry, I did not remember that you are also in the police. Well, there are good people in the police. Be man, Aga Sahib said while staring. Zishan tilted his head, smiling mischievously, and picked the landline phone. Zishan picked up the landline phone and dialed Inspector Ahmed's number. Hello, uncle, it's Zishan. I was just talking to my dad about those people you had in the morning. The ones you thought were saboteurs. Inspector Ahmed replied, Zishan, those were not saboteurs. Zishan continued, I thought one of them looked like a foreigner. Did he have an ID card? Inspector Ahmed explained, he did have an ID card, so he's not a foreigner. Besides, he had recommendations from important people. You're still young, Zishan, focus on your studies and let the adults handle these matters. Zishan quietly hung up the phone, deep in thought. Chapter 4 Missing Piece of a Perplexing Puzzle As the sun dipped below the horizon, Zishan hopped on his freestyle bicycle for an evening ride. His mind was filled with questions about the enigmatic saboteurs wreaking havoc in his town. Could they ever be captured? He couldn't help but ponder this as he pedaled through the streets. Stopping at a shop in the nearby shopping center, Zishan treated himself to an ice cream. His worries lingered as he savored each bite. Just then, something unusual caught his eye, the same common man with cat eyes. Without hesitation, Zishan hopped back on his bicycle and tailed the peculiar car. It meandered through the parking lot before finally settling in one spot. Zishan, always prepared, whipped out a pencil and his trusty diary, noting down the car's license plate number. After securing his bicycle to the side, he followed the mysterious driver discreetly, curious to discover their destination. To his surprise, the man entered a supermarket and emerged with a bottle of perfume. Zishan couldn't help but recall the distinctive scent, Black Man. The irony didn't escape him, the man, despite being white, wore black man perfume. With his curiosity piqued, Zishan retraced his path on his bicycle, making his way back home. However, his journey took an unexpected turn when a motorcyclist collided with him at a crossroads. Both tumbled to the ground, but before Zishan could react, the motorcyclist rushed to his aid, apologizing profusely. Assured that Zishan was unharmed, the man straightened the boy's clothes and left with a warm smile, mounting his motorcycle and departing. Upon arriving home, Zishan made a startling discovery. His diary was missing from his pocket. He couldn't help but wonder whether the motorcyclist had taken it during the collision or if it had slipped away in the commotion. And then it hit him like a bolt of lightning. The motorcyclist was the very same man he had seen with the cat-eyed individual at the police station. A common man, but the missing piece of a perplexing puzzle.
Chapter 5, The Diary's Return The morning sun cast a warm glow as Zishan was surprised to find Mali Baba standing before him, holding his lost diary. A sense of wonder filled Zishan as he questioned Mali Baba about the diary's sudden reappearance. Baba, where did you find this diary? Zishan inquired, his curiosity piqued. Mali Baba recounted how he had been tending to the garden near the gate when a stranger approached. This stranger had found the diary lying on the road and, noticing Zishan Babu's name, had promptly handed it over. Zishan's skepticism emerged as he asked, You didn't inquire further? Mali Baba responded, No, Sahib. I thanked him, and he left without asking any questions. He simply mentioned that it's good to return the diary to Zishan. Zishan contemplated the situation and pondered over the stranger's appearance. Can you describe the man's appearance and attire? He asked Gardner. Gardner recalled that the man had blinked frequently, was of shorter stature, wore pants and a shirt, and had a long red muffler around his neck. Zishan quickly grabbed his bicycle and headed out, ignoring Molly's cries of curiosity. His quest was to find this mysterious man. Lately, he had grown suspicious of everyone he encountered, fearing that they might be connected to the saboteurs. After a few rounds through the streets, he reached the main road. Zishan scanned the area, and just as he began to lose hope, he spotted a man approaching from a side street. The unexpected encounter left Zishan feeling trapped, unsure of how to react. His heart raced, but he stood his ground as the man approached him. Your name is Zishan? the man inquired. Zishan replied with a hint of humor, my diary didn't have my photo, did it? But the man remained serious, continuing to ask questions. Are you Mr. Aga's son? Zishan confirmed, yes, Mr. Aga is my father. The man explained that he found your diary and due to the address written inside. He recognized Zishan from the neighborhood and felt compelled to return it. Despite the absence of a photo, he knew it belonged to you. Grateful for the diary's return, Zishan attempted to leave on his bicycle, but the man restrained him. He wanted to discuss something important. Would you be my friend? the man asked, inviting Zishan to his house. Zishan, feeling uneasy and threatened, initially agreed, suggesting the man visit his home. However, the man expressed concern that Zishan's father, a senior officer, might not welcome his presence. Undeterred, he proposed, my house is nearby. If you visit, my younger brother, your age, would be thrilled to play with you. Zishan, eager to escape the situation, changed his mind. I have some work to attend to now. Perhaps another day, he replied. The man finally released Zishan's bicycle, and Zishan prepared to leave. However, the stranger's grip on his bicycle handle had been a mere distraction. In a sudden turn of events, a large jeep screeched to a halt nearby, and two men swiftly descended, overpowering Zishan. They muffled his cries, lifted him into the jeep, and as Zishan caught a familiar whiff of black man perfume, he lost consciousness. Chapter 6 The Mysterious Abduction Mr. Aga's office phone rang, and it was an alarming call. Zishan had been missing since the morning. He had left the house on his bicycle, skipped lunch, and hadn't returned. Mr. Aga rushed home after hearing the news and sought details from Zishan's mother. 
Unfortunately, they had no information about his whereabouts. Gathering all the household servants, they learned that Gardner had some information. He mentioned a man who had returned Zishan's missing diary and how Zishan had left the house to follow this stranger. Mr. Aga asked Gardner for a detailed description of the man's appearance and called the police station. He ordered them to find the man matching Gardner's description immediately. A missing person report for Zishan was promptly filed at the police station. Given Mr. Aga's esteemed position within the police force, the disappearance of his son was a matter of great concern. It disrupted ongoing secret police operations. Despite the crisis, a secret meeting was scheduled at Mr. Aga's house. The authorities decided that the meeting would proceed as planned and not be postponed due to Zishan's abduction. The city's police force, along with undercover agents, scoured every inch of the city. Raids were conducted at various known hideouts, but Zishan remained elusive. Mr. Aga was fraught with worry, and Zishan's mother wept inconsolably. Aga tried to comfort her, reminding her of their roles as a police officer's family. He assured her that Zishan would be safe, but she couldn't help but imagine the worst every time the phone rang. Every call from the police brought no news of Zishan. Aga and his wife sat by the telephone, brainstorming possible scenarios and questioning why Zishan had been taken, if indeed he had been kidnapped. Then, the phone rang again, and Aga answered. After a brief conversation, he abruptly hung up and rushed to the main gate of the house. Zishan's bicycle was there, but there was no sign of Zishan himself. Aga Imran instructed that the bicycle not be touched and called the police. He ordered them to inspect the bicycle for any possible evidence, such as fingerprints, and report their findings. Aga Imran's conviction grew stronger. He believed that Zishan had been abducted by the saboteurs. They seemed to have prior knowledge of their secret operations. Mr. Aga realized that there might be a mole within their ranks. Back at the secret meeting, Zishan entered the house and was immediately approached by the security personnel. Mr. Aga embraced his son, and the police officers bombarded Zishan with questions. Zishan recounted his ordeal, beginning with the smell that had made him lose consciousness. He had awakened in a luxurious bedroom, which was anything but ordinary. He noted the absence of Pakistani goods and the presence of smuggled items. A satellite telephone allowed communication in an unknown language. Zishan couldn't recall any Urdu or English being spoken. As for the kidnappers' appearances, they were masked or wearing makeup, disguising their true identities. It seemed as though they hailed from different countries, all possessing Kalashnikov rifles. Some had black hair, while others had brown, and they sported various facial hairstyles. Zishan had kept certain observations to himself, believing that revealing too much could jeopardize his safety. He noted that the house was filled with disorderly decorations and foreign items. During the conversation, the telephone rang again. Mr. Aga quickly picked it up and activated a recording device. The entire room listened in on the conversation. The voice on the other end conveyed a chilling message. The kidnappers revealed that they could have blackmailed Aga but chose not to. They boasted of their power and the ability to make governments tremble. They held Zishan's welfare hostage and warned Aga to stay out of their way if he wanted his family to remain safe. The line abruptly disconnected, leaving Aga bewildered and anguished. <laughs> Chapter 7, The Crisis Unfolds 
In a top-secret meeting, a decision was reached to intensively monitor cinemas, gyms, and cultural centers, places where people often gathered. Just two days after this decision, a devastating bomb exploded during a massive public gathering in Lahore. Nationwide strikes, protests, processions, and acts of vandalism erupted in response. Mr. Aga promptly convened another secret meeting and obtained government approval to temporarily ban all political gatherings. Additionally, he ordered stringent security measures for public gatherings. Just a few days earlier, a bomb had detonated in Karachi's bustling market, revealing that even crowded markets were not safe from attacks. As the emergency situation escalated, high-ranking officials, from heads of state to lower-level officers, descended upon Karachi to address the crisis. The public's discontent was growing as they perceived the government's response as inadequate. Some believed that the government was incapable of dealing with the situation, and this sentiment fueled further unrest. The wave of vandalism continued, and Mr. Aga expressed his concern to his officers, remarking that they had failed to anticipate the market explosion. They had focused on monitoring cinemas but had overlooked the markets. One senior officer requested permission to speak frankly, stating that their decision seemed to reach the saboteurs. Mr. Aga inquired about the officer's point. The officer explained that despite trusting his colleagues, it was evident that their decisions were somehow being leaked to the saboteurs. He noted that when they monitored cinemas, bombings occurred elsewhere. There was no direct correlation between their surveillance and the attacks. Inspector Ahmed disagreed, arguing that surveillance should deter attacks. However, the officer countered that the terrorists were strategic and always knew where there was no security. Mr. Aga intervened, calming the escalating tension among the officers. He emphasized the need for a coherent plan of action. He urged them to devise individual master plans within a day, which would be discussed collectively to form a grand master plan. This plan would guide their actions moving forward. Zishan was secretly listening to the proceedings of the secret meeting. As soon as the meeting was over, he hurriedly went to sleep in his room. He thought that these people were only holding meetings. If he somehow found out about the saboteurs, he would kill them. He was blown up by their bombs and he fell asleep thinking that tomorrow he would go out again in search of the saboteur's base. Chapter 8 Unmasking the Enemy in the ongoing secret meetings, Inspector Javed suspected the presence of a spy within Mr. Aga's house, leaking information to the saboteurs. However, Inspector Siddiqui had a different theory. He believed that the saboteurs had planted a tiny transmitter or FM microphone within Mr. Aga's house to eavesdrop and relay information. To test this theory, they decided to move all future meetings to a different undisclosed location away from Mr. Aga's house. The results were promising. However, the saboteurs adapted to this change in strategy. Instead of bombings, they began sowing the seeds of civil unrest, starting in Karachi. One morning during breakfast, Zishan confronted his father about the escalating situation. He showed his father the newspaper headlines, which depicted a grim state of affairs caused by these explosive incidents. Zishan expressed his concern and asked his father if they would take any action against these perpetrators. Mr. Aga, deeply troubled by the news, remained silent, offering no immediate response. Undeterred, Zishan sought answers from his mother as he continued reading the newspaper. 
The headlines narrated a harrowing story of violence. Shah Faisal Colony in Karachi had been set ablaze, resulting in the destruction of over a hundred houses and shops. The army had to intervene as the police struggled to control the situation. The newspaper reported that armed assailants had attacked Natha Khan Gadazimpara and Shah Faisal Colony at 4 o'clock in the morning. They ransacked homes, set fires, and unleashed violence upon the residents. Tragically, 11 people had lost their lives and 60 others were injured. The attackers employed modern weapons and daggers in their assault. Despite the police and administration's eventual arrival, they failed to quell the chaos. Facing an escalating crisis, a curfew was imposed in the area, and the army was summoned to restore order. Witnesses and victims' families spoke to the media, detailing the horrors they had endured. They lamented the government's silence and the transformation of Shah Faisal colony into a disaster zone. Zishan, having finished reading the news, questioned his father's opinion on the police's role in this incident. Mr. Aga, overcome with anger, abruptly stood up, clutching his stick and donning his cap. He left the house with determination, his footsteps echoing with purpose. Chapter 9, The Hidden Threat Mr. Aga, determined to uncover the saboteurs, took immediate action. He assigned a team to closely monitor his employees and instructed another team to search every nook and cranny of his house for any hidden transmitters. They employed the most advanced methods, but their search yielded no evidence of a transmitter or wireless microphone. Meanwhile, Zishan returned home with a friend, Tarek, after hearing about the riots in Hyderabad and Karachi. His father expressed his concern, a mix of love and scolding, reminding Zishan not to stay out too long without informing the family. Mr. Aga emphasized the importance of communication. Zishan introduced Tarek, his schoolmate, to his father. Mr. Aga allowed them to play carom in Zishan's room and encouraged Zishan to take a friend along whenever he left the house. As they played, an undercover operative, engaged in the search, discreetly informed Mr. Aga that the transmitter was located in Zishan's room. Aga instructed them to search the room, but only when Zishan was not present. His anxiety grew as he realized that the saboteurs might have infiltrated his home. That evening, Zishan went to the drawing room to study with religious scholar. The room was thoroughly searched, but no transmitter was found. Mr. Aga's worry deepened as he questioned the police officer about the device's presence. The officer explained that it existed but had mysteriously vanished. Shortly after, the officer returned with startling news. There was a hidden bugging device in the drawing room, likely taken there by Zishan. They believed Zishan intended to give it to Malvi Sahib or transmit information to the saboteurs. Mr. Aga, torn between suspicion and trust, listened closely to Zishan and Malvi Sahib's conversation from a distance. Malvi Sahib recited an old lesson and introduced a new one, which Zishan repeated after him. After some time, Malvi Sahib left the room, and Zishan went back to his own. No suspicious exchange occurred between them. Mr. Aga turned to the police officer, who suggested searching the drawing room. However, the officer detected no signal from the transmitter, indicating it was no longer there. The mysterious disappearance of the transmitter left Mr. Aga perplexed, unsure of how the saboteurs operated within the sanctuary of his own home. Chapter 10 Unveiling the Secret Mr. Aga's concerns weighed heavily on his mind. 
He couldn't fathom how his own son might be working for the saboteurs. Was Zishan being coerced or blackmailed into this perilous path? His suspicions were fueled by the fact that Zishan had seemingly become an expert at concealing the transmitter. Aga couldn't shake the idea that this might not be his real son, but an imposter working for the saboteurs. He took immediate action, moving his important documents to a secure location and changing the meeting venue. One day, Aga's health deteriorated, and he was prescribed capsules. Lost in thought, he accidentally let one capsule stick to his palate before finally swallowing it. This accident sparked an idea, what if Zishan was unwittingly carrying a microtransmitter capsule inside him? Aga went straight to Zishan's room and communicated through written notes, signaling the need for secrecy. Zishan was surprised but complied. Aga inquired in writing if Zishan had a transmitter. Zishan, still in shock, wrote N.O. Aga had brought a device to check for transmitters and began scanning Zishan's body. His hunch was right, there was indeed a microtransmitter capsule hidden within Zishan's body. It allowed the saboteurs to eavesdrop on conversations within Aga House from their headquarters. Aga shared all the details with Zishan, assuring him that they were aware of the transmitter and needed his help to catch the saboteurs. Zishan conveyed his willingness to assist his father. Aga immediately summoned his trusted officers for a secret meeting where he explained the situation. They made two crucial decisions. First, they would hold two types of meetings. One would take place outside the house in a secure location to discuss their original plan, while the second would be held at Aga's home. Where Zishan would provide false information to the saboteurs, attempting to ensnare them. Additionally, they decided to place a pendant around Zishan's neck. This pendant served as an emergency button. If Sishan ever felt his life was in jeopardy or if he fell into the saboteur's trap, he could press the button. This would alert the police, who would not only rush to Zishan's aid but also trace the saboteurs through the pendant. Mr. Aga stressed that, at this point, Zishan was an integral part of their mission and it was the collective national duty of all involved to protect him. Chapter 11, A Dangerous Proposition The country was ablaze with violence. Explosions rocked markets, leaving gruesome scenes of human carnage. Fratricide became disturbingly common. Banks fell prey to ruthless robbers, who brazenly stormed in during broad daylight, taking lives and money with them. Terrifying threats silenced those who considered reporting these crimes to the police, leaving the government oblivious to the extent of the chaos spreading across the nation. The saboteur's ultimate goal was to stoke hatred among the country's various provinces, Sindhi, Punjabi, Balochi, Patan, Mahajar, Kashmiri, pitting them against each other in a deadly game. Civil war seemed imminent, and the saboteurs intended to exploit this internal strife, aided by foreign support and numerous terrorist organizations. At the highest echelons of power, authorities were desperately searching for a solution. A strict order was issued to crack down on illegal weapons and punish those found in possession of them. On a Friday, after offering prayers at the city's Grand Mosque alongside his father, Zishan received permission to visit his friend Tarek's house, where they engaged in video games. Amid their gaming banter, Zishan used... Tarek, there should be a video game where the police battle saboteurs, and I'll top the leaderboard, eliminating every last one of them. Their playful mission to destroy saboteurs was interrupted when Tarek's servant informed them that Zishan had received a phone call. Zishan assumed it was from his mother or father, inquiring about his well-being. 
However, it turned out to be a stranger on the line. Who are you? Zishan questioned. Think of me as a shadow lurking around your home, the mysterious caller responded. Uneasy, Zishan inquired, why did you call me? Because your father's life is in jeopardy, the caller replied. Zishan's heart raced as he asked, what do you mean? It means we can obliterate your father with a single bomb anytime we please, the voice on the other end threatened. You won't even find a trace of his body. If you wish to spare your father's life, do a simple task for us. Fear gripped Sishan. He struggled to speak, his body drenched in sweat. What do you want? It's a minor task for you, a trifling one, the caller said. There's a file in your father's room containing a comprehensive plan to eradicate the saboteurs. Get us a photocopy of that file. No, I can't do that. Zishan protested, his voice trembling. Lower your voice, came the stern response. You wouldn't want anyone overhearing our conversation. If you refuse, your father will meet his end tomorrow evening. This is your final chance. Steal that file and have it photocopied by tomorrow evening near the photostat machine near your home. Otherwise, your father's lifeless body will arrive at your doorstep tomorrow evening. The call abruptly ended, leaving Zishan in turmoil. He hung up, returned to Tarek's house, and could barely focus. Tarek inquired, whose call was that? It was my father, Zishan lied nervously, unable to confide in his friend any further. After leaving Tarek's house, he returned home, lay on his bed, and agonized over the difficult decision he had to make. In the end, he made up his mind to steal the file. <laughs> Chapter 12 The Secret Base of the Saboteurs Zishan embarked on his mission to find the file in his father's room, a mission filled with tension and danger. He scoured every nook and cranny, but the file was nowhere to be found. Perhaps his father had taken it with him. As he conducted his search, he stumbled upon a set of keys in one of the drawers. With these keys, Zishan gained access to more drawers and cupboards, intensifying his quest for the elusive file. He had to be cautious, constantly watching the door to ensure no one caught him. Mr. Aga had even placed a spy among the household employees, and Zishan couldn't risk his mother discovering him either. Fortunately, he noticed his mother engrossed in the kitchen, giving instructions to the cook. Zishan felt the urgency of his mission as he scanned the room. He was determined to avoid detection and prayed that no one would stumble upon him. Finally, his persistence paid off when he opened a drawer containing the coveted file. With a vigilant eye on the door, he swiftly retrieved the file, closed all the drawers, and returned to his room. His next challenge was to find a way to photocopy the file without arousing suspicion within his household. After careful planning and timing, Zishan managed to hide the file successfully and slip out of the house. The nearest photostat machine was located at a nearby general store. He entered the store and requested a copy of each page from the file. However, just as the first page was being photocopied, the ominous figure of Blackman Perfume entered the store. With his blonde hair, cat-like eyes, thorn-like mustache, and an enigmatic face that seemed foreign yet clad in Pakistani attire, he approached Zishan, striking up a conversation in Urdu. Although he struggled with the language, he managed quite well. Blackman Perfume personally collected all the copies while the original file was handed to Zishan, who recoiled from touching it. 
As the photocopying process concluded, he settled the bill himself and then beckoned Zishan to follow him. Zishan, his nerves strained but determined not to go with him at any cost, clutched his bicycle and made his way homeward. He discreetly returned the file to its rightful place and retreated to his room, lying on the bed as he contemplated his actions. Had he made the right choice, or had he made a terrible mistake? Zishan grappled with his inner turmoil, knowing that he needed to inform his father about the situation as soon as he returned home. He had acted out of necessity, believing that his actions were necessary to expedite measures against the saboteurs, preventing them from exploiting the grand plan. Zishan intended to confess to his father and let him decide the course of action. In the meantime, he pretended to visit his friend's house and enlisted Tarek's company. Together, they set off on their bicycles, their destination sector Z. Zishan had a hunch that this sector held the secret headquarters of the saboteurs. He had previously ventured into this area, alone or with Tarek, examining the surroundings for clues. When he was kidnapped, he had noted certain signs in the vicinity, and now he was determined to turn his suspicions into concrete evidence. As they cycled through the streets of Sector Z, Zishan abruptly halted, gesturing for Tarek to do the same. They had reached a specific street where a red jeep, belonging to Blackman Perfume, was parked within a large house. Zishan's heart raced with the realization that he might have discovered the secret base of the saboteurs. Chapter 13, The Bleeding Television Screen the news of the bomb explosion was once again gaining an important place in the television news. More than half of the news bulletin was full of bomb explosions, screams, dead bodies, and bloodshed. Skyscrapers were raised to the ground. Human organs were being extracted separately from under the debris. People were stuck on the TV screen due to the shell of the bombs. Zishan felt that the whole television was bathed in human blood and now the blood would start falling out of the television set onto the carpet. Zishan's father had not come home yet, he thought many times to call father, but there was a ban on his speaking, he started waiting, I don't know why Mr. Aga was late. Finally, the call came from Mr. Aga's office. Aga will not come home today due to the explosion. They are on the spot and will go for an important meeting afterwards. Zishan was in a hurry to tell his father about the file as soon as possible so that he does not take any action while implementing the plan of the file and he himself gets into trouble. Zishan could not sleep the whole night in the presence of this problem. In the morning he got his eye somewhere. When Zishan's mother woke up at the time of morning prayer, she first asked if father had come, but her mother's answer was in the negative. Zishan prayed and prayed to Allah Almighty for his father. Allah knows everything. So he also knows how much I love my country. What I did was not anti-national, I thought that if Abu was killed, the saboteurs would be successful and if father was alive, they would surely punish the enemies of the country. Either Allah make these saboteurs fail. Allah save my country. Tears were flowing from his eyes and he was prostrated. With the first rays of the sun, Zishan's mother was informed on the telephone that Mr. Aga has been arrested and sent to jail. Because he had handed over the copy of a very important file to international elements. Zishan's mother was overwhelmed with disbelief and despair, unable to fathom how Aga could ever betray his country. Tears streamed down her face as she questioned the possibility of such a betrayal. She was convinced that her husband would willingly sacrifice his life but could never stoop to betray his homeland. Meanwhile, Zishan, 
understanding the gravity of the situation, sought his mother's permission and rushed to the jail to meet his father. Upon introducing himself, he was swiftly led to his father's cell. Aga appeared worn and troubled, his eyes bearing the marks of sleepless nights. Zishan, initially discussing trivial matters, soon produced pen and paper to recount the entire sequence of events. He expressed his deep remorse for his actions and confessed his involvement in the recent developments. Aga reassured Zishan, urging him not to worry. He instructed him to return home and console his distraught mother. He emphasized the importance of Zishan remaining at home and avoiding any unnecessary risks. Aga had already spoken to his lawyer and believed he would secure his release on bail by evening. Before parting, Mr. Aga shared more about the unfolding plot. He revealed that Inspector Ahmed, who had recently been arrested, was connected to the saboteurs, either willingly or under coercion. Inspector Ahmed, aware that his secret had been compromised, conspired with the saboteurs. They fabricated a witness, along with a photocopy of a false file, falsely implicating Mr. Aga. This file contained his forged signature and differed from the file he had at home, where he had made personal notes and markings. Inspector Ahmed was part of the committee finalizing the grand plan, and before handing over the genuine file to Aga, he had created a photocopy with the forged signature. The photocopy was then switched with Mr. Aga's file. This deception had complicated matters, especially as Zishan had also copied the original file and provided it to the enemy. <laughs> Chapter 14 Death Following You Mr. Aga's lawyer reassured him, calling the matter trivial. He inquired if he could obtain the original file from Aga's house. Aga agreed, instructing the lawyer to visit his house, where Zishan knew the file's location and could provide access. The lawyer promised to do his best to secure Mr. Aga's release, possibly even on the same day. Upon returning home, the lawyer encountered Zishan, who had expected his father's instructions. The lawyer introduced himself, and Zishan immediately recognized him. Zishan agreed to provide the file, claiming he knew its whereabouts. Yes, I know. Zishan looked at the lawyer carefully and said, I will give that file to you. Zishan immediately took out the keys and opened the drawer, but the file was not there. Meanwhile, Zishan's mother entered Aga's room. The lawyer stood up and said salam. I am Mr. Aga's lawyer and have come to collect a file. What? Mrs. Aga said in surprise. Another lawyer had come before you and there was an inspector with him that he was Aga's lawyer and he needed an important file, so he took a file out of the drawer. The entire country quaked with the thunderous explosions of bombs. Amidst the chaos and pandemonium, no one seemed to have a clue about what to do next. Subversive elements ran amok, torching buildings and inciting riots. Looting became rampant. The nation teetered on the brink of anarchy and disorder. Despite the government's assurances, the situation spiraled out of control. High-level meetings convened daily, yet they yielded no tangible results. The saboteurs held the people in their grip, orchestrating bombings on one side and fomenting mayhem and violence on the other. This tactic effectively diverted the attention of the police and depleted their resources, preventing them from effectively pursuing the saboteurs. Aga still languished behind bars, denied bail. One day, when Zishan visited him, he brought along a fresh newspaper. Placing it before his father, he exclaimed, Dad, this is the news I've been waiting for. 
They've apprehended the saboteurs responsible for the blasts in Peshawar, Karachi, and Balochistan. They suspect the involvement of a particular foreign country. This is the headline from Lahore, and the Federal Minister of Law and Parliamentary Affairs has confirmed the arrest of the individuals behind these bombings. Their tactics and materials strongly suggest foreign involvement, possibly from neighbor country. The news also mentions that foreigners engaged in international activities will be deported. Dad, doesn't this mean that we'll finally have some peace? Zishan inquired hopefully. With a sigh, Aga responded, Son, such news appears in the newspapers every day, and politicians make similar statements. The reality unfolding in our country suggests that this news is nothing more than momentary solace. My happiness will come when there is genuine peace in our land. Peace means no more explosions, no more killings, and no need for such news. People will understand on their own that the saboteurs have been defeated. Their conversation was interrupted by the arrival of the jailer. After instructing Zishan to return home, he somberly informed Mr. Aga that Inspector Ahmed had been shot and killed. Inspector Ahmed had been returning home from duty when, upon entering his street, he was ambushed and shot dead with a rifle. A note found in his pocket, seemingly written by a child, read, We are aware of your meetings with the saboteurs. Beware, death follows you. <laughs> Chapter 15 Race Against Time The following day, Mr. Aga Imran sent a message summoning Zishan and inquired about the letter found on Inspector Ahmed's body. He wanted to know if Zishan was somehow involved in the murder because the police were actively searching for the letter's author. Aga revealed to Zishan that he had learned that his handwriting matched the letters and some police officers suspected that the writer had deliberately made the letter appear as if it were penned by a child. Zishan admitted to writing the letter but professed ignorance about the murder. He also disclosed that he and his friend Tarek had jointly sent letters to city dignitaries and top government officials, accusing Inspector Ahmed of collusion with the saboteurs. They believed that this information had led to Inspector Ahmed's arrest, making him a target for the saboteurs. Concerned, Zishan asked, What will happen now? Aga responded, Whatever is decreed by Allah. In every situation, one must be grateful to God. When a person knows he is innocent, he should have faith in Allah. Even if all the falsehoods in the world unite against the truth, they cannot prevail. Truth always triumphs. Later, in the evening, when the lawyer came to visit Mr. Aga, he delivered some good news. Congratulations, Mr. Aga. I've gathered substantial evidence against Inspector Ahmed. Numerous witnesses and clear evidence prove that he was involved with the saboteurs. Furthermore, after Inspector Ahmed's death, the witness who had testified against you recanted, fearing for his life. He now claims that those people will even kill him in jail. Mr. Aga, your bail will be granted as soon as the courts open tomorrow morning. Yet, despite the hopeful news, Aga couldn't shake off his worries about Zishan. He implored the jailer to arrange for him to meet Inspector Shoaib or speak to him over the phone. The jailer complied and called Inspector Shoaib, conveying Aga Imran's request to see him. Inspector Shoaib promptly arrived at the jail cell. I just wanted to talk to you about Zishan, Mr. Aga explained, his voice tinged with concern. Please ensure that he is safe. You know he was kidnapped by saboteurs before, and he wears a pendant with a transmitter. 
We also have a receiver to monitor his whereabouts and safety. If he's in danger, I want the police to be alerted. Inspector Shoaib nodded and agreed to keep a watchful eye on Zishan's pendant location. Not long after, Inspector Shoaib received a call. He was informed that Zishan and Tarek needed to be arrested. When he called Mr. Aga Imran to share this news, it left Aga feeling uneasy. What do you intend to do? he inquired. Inspector Shoaib hesitated for a moment before replying, Sir, I was thinking of talking to you about it first. Arresting them won't be easy. I thought I'd explain the situation to you. Mr. Aga Imran, showing understanding, advised, It's better if you keep them under your watch. Tell their families that I've called them over to my place for their safety. That should keep them safe. My bail should be granted tomorrow, and I hope that'll ease some of the worries I have about Zishan. Later in the evening, Inspector Shoaib received another call. This time, he learned that Zishan and Tarek had left their homes secretly, and their families were in the dark about their whereabouts. Mr. Aga Imran, concerned, told Inspector Shoaib, I want to tell you something that I can't discuss over the phone. Come to see me immediately. Inspector Shoaib arrived shortly, and Aga Imran divulged to him the information provided by Zishan. According to Zishan, the saboteurs had a base in a house in Sector Z, containing a significant stash of currency, firearms, explosives, and vehicles used for attacks throughout the country. Aga Imran was convinced that Zishan and Tarek were somewhere near that house. He worried that Zishan might get caught up in a dangerous situation and advised Inspector Shoaib to immediately surround Sector Z and locate Zishan using the device information. He emphasized the importance of avoiding confrontations or damage to surrounding houses. Chapter 16 Saboteur's Headquarter The night was shrouded in darkness as Tarek and Zishan cautiously observed the headquarters of the saboteurs. Unusually high traffic flowed into the compound, each vehicle meticulously inspected before being allowed entry. The tension in the air was palpable as the gate closed behind each car, sealing their fate within. There were no bystanders outside the gate, no vehicles waiting. It seemed every saboteur in the country had converged on this location for an important meeting. Zishan exchanged a glance with Tarek and jotted a message on a piece of paper, I'm going inside this bungalow. If a policeman inquires, tell them our location. If things get dangerous, I'll use the pendants button, and hopefully, someone will come to help. If not, contact Inspector Shoaib. Tarek attempted to dissuade Zishan with gestures, but his resolve was unwavering. They had already hidden their bicycles and now approached the rear of the bungalow, seeking an entry point. Zishan identified a single option, climbing the sewer pipe and then a tree inside the compound. He checked the matchbox in his pocket, having kept it since the day he discovered the bungalow's location. As Sishan reached for the tree's branches, Tarek sensed someone approaching. There was an individual stumbling along, more from drunkenness than clumsiness. The stranger passed, taking slow, erratic steps, puffing on a cigarette. Tarek realized that the stumbling was intentional, as the man seemed inebriated. Tarek directed his gaze upwards, where Zishan was carefully descending towards the trunk of the tree, preferring stealth over noise. Once out of sight, Tarek retrieved his bicycle and cycled away, despite the freezing night. He was sweating, trying to navigate with a malfunctioning bicycle, his mind racing with worry. 
He prayed for a policeman to arrive soon and inform them about Zishan's whereabouts. Meanwhile, as Inspector Shoaib departed, Haga Imran implored the jailer to release him temporarily, promising to return promptly. The jailer, however, remained adamant, citing the welfare of his own family. Aga persisted, you know my son's life is in danger. The jailer retorted, I cannot jeopardize my children's well-being. Aga glanced at the door and was about to leave when the jailer aimed a pistol at him. Sir, don't force me to shoot, the jailer warned. Aga pleaded with the jailer to consider his son's precarious situation, but the jailer remained steadfast. Aga's frustration reached its limits, and in an impulsive moment, he managed to disarm the jailer. Taking control, Aga handcuffed the jailer to his own table, silencing him with a cloth. Then, he collected a set of civilian clothes the jailer had kept in the office and locked the room from the outside. The telephone incessantly rang inside, but Aga couldn't afford any further delays. A police motorcycle stationed nearby caught Aga's attention. He started the bike and made his exit from the jail. At the gate, officers congratulated him on his bail, and one even offered to drive him in a jeep. The situation unraveled swiftly, and a manhunt for Mr. Aga commenced. Yet, he remained an enigma, lost to the depths of the night, eluding capture as though swallowed by the vast expanse of the sky. Chapter 17, The Night of Unforeseen Courage As Sishon's feet touched the ground, the menacing barks of the guard dogs echoed through the eerie silence of the night, sending shivers down his spine. He teetered on the edge of fear, a precipice where tears threatened to flow. But Zishan found his inner strength, and with a fervent prayer to Allah, he implored for courage and fortitude to confront these adversaries and save his father, while also purging his homeland of these saboteurs. His prayer seemed to summon an otherworldly strength, infusing his entire being with newfound determination. Zishan darted down a dimly lit corridor and slipped through an unlocked door. As he entered, the cacophony of canine uproar ceased, and he found himself in the company of shadowy figures brandishing Kalashnikovs. Startled, they scurried about, taking cover like bandits eluding the law. Zishan surveyed his surroundings and carefully charted a course, moving stealthily. Voices resonated from one side of the building, and he instinctively veered away from them, recognizing that any sound could betray his presence to the saboteurs. A daring notion crossed his mind. Perhaps these malevolent individuals, congregated here, were unaware of the tracking device implanted within his body. Summoning his courage, he peeked into a vast chamber, where around fifty ominous figures conversed in English, conspiring about the propagation of evil within his beloved country. They were plotting an assault from within. Among them were those who had undertaken missions in Pakistan after their success in Afghanistan, and others who had previously wreaked havoc in the former East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. Each of them boasted of their past exploits and triumphs, their boasts echoing through the chamber. Zishan, heart pounding, listened intently when he suddenly detected the scent of the ominous figure with cat-like eyes, blonde hair, and menacingly sharp teeth, the same man who resembled a white bear. He was grinning, exuding an air of malevolence. Meanwhile, Inspector Shoaib traced the pendant's signal and reached Sector Z, parking his jeep near Tarek, who was still fussing over the bicycle chain. 
Tarek, upon seeing Inspector Shoaib, immediately embraced him, his eyes brimming with tears. Uncle Zishan, what happened to Zishan? Tarek implored. Inspector Shoaib consoled the distraught Tarek, explaining that Zishan had ventured inside the bungalow and had yet to return. Tarek had waited with bated breath, fearing the worst. You've done your part, Tarek, Inspector Shoaib reassured him, summoning a police officer to escort Tarek home. Remember, stay indoors. If you venture out, I'll have to take you to the police station. Understood. Okay, uncle, Tarek replied, wiping away his tears. Inspector Shoaib swiftly communicated with the surrounding police units, maintaining secrecy about their movements and positions to avoid alerting the public. Just as he concluded his preparations, Aga arrived on a motorcycle, leaving Inspector Shoaib visibly surprised. Chapter 18, Hands Up Alka Imran, determined as ever, insisted on entering the bungalow to assess the situation firsthand before taking action. After some deliberation, Inspector Shoaib agreed, ceding control of the operation to Mr. Alka. It was crucial to evacuate the nearby residents discreetly, ensuring the criminals couldn't escape amid chaos. Alga Imran carefully selected the best trained police officers and led the charge into the bungalow. Inside, chaos unfolded. Gunshots merged with the canine barks until Alga Imran's men swiftly subdued the security personnel, rendering them powerless. The guard dogs, too, were silenced by silent bullets. Taking stock of the situation, Aga Imran realized the gravity of the ongoing meeting in the Grand Hall. These malevolent individuals were gleefully endorsing a plan to annihilate the nation, their sinister smiles betraying their malicious intent. Aga Imran briefed Inspector Shoaib about the virus, admitting he had underestimated its potency, it was more like a malignant tumor than a minor ailment. The urgency of the situation necessitated swift action. Aga Imran ordered Inspector Shoaib to have their forces encircle the bungalow with a staggered entry approach to ensure no terrorists could escape. He emphasized the importance of placing key officers near the main gate. Aga Imran then directed his team to meticulously search every room within the ominous palace in their quest to find Zishan. As the officers fanned out, Aga Imran continued to coordinate, gradually wresting control from the security personnel monitoring the bungalow. His men secured the perimeter around the Grand Hall. Inside, an eerie silence blanketed the bungalow, with no shots fired. Suddenly, an ill-advised move led to a burst of gunfire from one corner, jolting everyone present. A panicked police officer rushed to report that one of their own had been killed, and the criminals had become aware of their presence. With no time to waste, Aga Imran signaled for his police force to storm the Grand Hall. They converged from all entrances, instantly shattering the once jovial atmosphere into chilling silence. In a commanding voice, Aga Imran ordered all individuals inside to raise their hands. A shot rang out as one of the criminals defied Aga Imran's orders. Aga returned fire, sparking an exchange of bullets. The defiant assailant fell, but Mr. Aga, too, was wounded. Undeterred, Mr. Aga Imran stood resolutely, his voice laced with dread as he addressed the criminal with cat-like eyes, blonde hair, and sharp teeth. Aga Imran I told you not to obstruct us, he declared. 
The ominous figure retorted, questioning Aga Imran's unwavering commitment, suggesting it was the love for his son that had drawn him their midst. He claimed to possess Zishan, insinuating that a mere gesture could end his life. Leave secretly while you still can, he advised. You know that a transmitter has been hidden inside your son's body. Yes, I know, replied Aga Imran. We also knew that you knew and that's why you used to talk to your son by writing on paper, but you probably don't know that a part of this capsule is also a powerful time bomb. And if I just press a button, after exactly five minutes, your son will be blown away. Not only your son, but also around will suffer a lot. Aga Imran felt as if the bullet had hit him not in his arm, but in his heart. Chapter 19 This is not the end. In a swift and calculated move, the man with cat eyes signaled to his security guard to retrieve Zishan. Moments later, the static-filled voice of the guard crackled over the walkie-talkie. Boss! Zishan isn't here, and I've been captured by Mr. Aga's men. What? Zishan isn't there? The leader's tone turned sinister. This means, Mr. Aga, that our negotiation time has come to an end. You may not realize it, but ending our dialogue signifies the end of a mighty forces conversation with a far weaker one. You still have time to withdraw your police from my territory. Otherwise, I will press this button, and you will have just five minutes. In that time, you won't be able to get your son to the hospital. Before Aga could make a decision, an urgent message crackled over Inspector Shoaib's wireless. Aga stepped out of the bungalow with his team. It can't be, Aga muttered. Sir, please hear me out, Inspector Shoaib implored. Time is running out. Come to the main gate and listen. All right, Mr. Aga, Inspector Shoaib continued, realizing the gravity of the situation. I'm here. Your men are coming out quietly. As Aga exited the bungalow, the saboteur's accomplices swiftly retrieved their weapons, and the leader, the enigmatic white bear, couldn't help but laugh. Once Aga reached the main gate, he locked eyes with Inspector Shoaib. The atmosphere was tense, and the saboteurs were ready for their next move. The white bear-like figure barked orders, and the saboteurs unleashed a hail of gunfire toward the police officers from their fortified position inside the bungalow. Chaos ensued, and Inspector Shoaib's team scrambled for cover. As Aga Imran stood at the gate, contemplating his next move, he received a vital message from Inspector Shoaib. Keep your composure, Inspector Shoaib advised, interpreting Aga's unspoken thoughts. I was fully aware of what was happening inside. Zishan is safe, and I've already arranged for him to be taken to the hospital. You need to get there immediately. All right. I'm on my way, Aga Imran replied, but with a determined resolve, he added, no one will escape alive from that bungalow. As soon as Aga Imran departed for the hospital, Inspector Shoaib contemplated Zishan's daring actions inside the bungalow. He doubted anyone inside would survive the impending explosion. Upon reaching the hospital five minutes later, Aga Imran, his injuries still fresh, was trembling with worry, his thoughts consumed by Zishan. He approached the operating room and was relieved to see Zishan inside, sharing a moment of laughter with the doctor. Overcome with emotion, 
Aga embraced Zishan, tears streaming down his face like a child. Dr. Siddiqui immediately attended to Aga Imran's injuries, extracting the bullet from his arm and skillfully dressing the wound. After the necessary first aid, Dr. Siddiqui divulged the details of the capsule retrieved from Zishan's body. It was composed of two parts, a transmitter and a time bomb. They had managed to remove the capsule mere moments before it detonated. Aga Imran's relief was palpable. As the weight of the situation lifted, Zishan recounted his daring feats inside the bungalow. He had been locked in a room by the saboteurs, but through sheer determination, he had escaped by breaking a window. From there, he had explored the bungalow's interior, eventually finding his way to the basement. There, he stumbled upon a massive cache of weaponry, ammunition, and crates of dollars. With extraordinary resourcefulness, Zishan rigged an explosive device, ensuring that if they failed to evacuate in time, the burning fuse would reach the gunpowder pile. He then exited the basement, sealing the door behind him. When he emerged, he was discovered by the police, and Inspector Shoaib immediately had him rushed to the hospital, keeping the saboteurs distracted. Inspector Shoaib had made multiple attempts to apprehend the saboteurs, wishing to unveil the international conspiracy, but their relentless gunfire and refusal to surrender thwarted his efforts. Time passed swiftly, and inevitably, the lit fuse reached the gunpowder, resulting in a series of explosions. The once magnificent bungalow was reduced to rubble in a matter of moments, ensuring that none of those who conspired against the country survived. Aga Imran prepared to leave for the police academy, while Zishan was ready to return to school after the holidays. Before parting ways, Aga received an unexpected gift, handed to him by gatekeeper. Opening the package, he discovered a bottle of black man perfume. Zishan immediately asked Gardner how was that man? He replied that he was in a red jeep, cat eyes that were small in proportion to his face. The hair was blonde. I also asked him his name but he said Aga Imran knows me well. You just deliver this gift to him. Dad. Zishan was worried and asked his father, Will all of bungalow people would have survived? Aga reassured his son, No, only their leader will have survived. This individual is cunning and dangerous, and he never spares those who work alongside him during perilous missions. There must be a secret passage within that bungalow known only to him. With Allah's guidance, a day will come when we enter our enemy's abode and bring him to justice. As they looked to the future, the father and son shared a moment of profound determination, vowing to protect their homeland from those who sought to harm it.